Um, so just for those of you that don't know me, um, our, our, um, I am from the veterinary school, so it is you know kind of the ivory tower versus the real world. But we do run our own spay neuter clinic actually on the vet school campus, and we try to create like a pseudo real world setting um, for our students so that they're more prepared. Um, my whole team is here, so. Um, they can attest to that. We have a couple of different clinical settings. We have the typical sort of junior dog spay lab, um, which we do for all the third year students where they're all spaying two dogs. And that's where they first learn to do anesthesia and surgery. So I call that um, low volume. Um, it's, it's you know much different than what we're typically doing in high volume efficient anesthesia for spay neuter. Um, and then we do a senior elective um, and we do a high volume clinic on Fridays where we try to be more like a real HQHV clinic. Um, we call it high volume for us, that's 20 to 30 surgeries a day, which is a lot. Um, we do that with two veterinarians, one who's there to teach the students and one who's there to make sure we can get the number of animals done that's needed. And those clients are um, shelter, rescue, animal control, and low income pet owners from our community. And then we do monthly community cat clinics um, where you typically do, we're actually running out of cats in New England. Um, we typically do around 60 to 80 cats, um, but we've done as much as 120. So we have the um, revised ASV guidelines. We, it was put together by the, task, the ASV task force for the advancement of spay neuter. And I was really honored and privileged to join the task force just for the second iteration. Um, and in the first go around, they had one anesthesiologist and it turned out that People had so many questions for her, she was sort of tortured over this, so she asked for help. So this time she added two of her colleagues. So there are three anesthesiologists on the task force this year. And the anesthesia section is kind of a long section in the document. And since I personally checked all the references, I can tell you that's a lot of references. Um, so we really tried to update the guidelines to make sure that some of the latest um, uh, evidence and articles are included. So it's good references for you guys if you want to look stuff up. You know, why are they saying this? Why is she talking about that? And when we're doing, there's been already several things kind of talking about things that have been updated, trying to be evidence-based with what's kind of in the literature. So um, there's a lot of things sort of thrown in this talk and we'll see how we get to. Um, I'll try to take questions at the end if we have enough time. That being said, if you have a burning, burning question, feel free to raise your hand during and I'll try to get to that. Um, but we're gonna put the emphasis on the actual drugs that we use in our protocols just to kind of give you guys a quick review, just to kind of keep those in our minds. Um, and then we're gonna focus a lot on monitoring and maintaining patient safety, which is a huge part of your all's um, job. So one thing that we added in the guidelines this time was a little bit more um, detail on the patient history section. So it's real important if you're the one talking to the pet owner or the shelter um, staff that's bringing in the animal or giving you the history if you have any, um, that you try to collect as much information about um, any previous procedures, especially any previous like allergic reactions or problems. Sometimes um, owners are aware of issues that their animals may have had. Um, any medications or supplements or wacky things that the owners may be giving, some of them could be a problem for us, and certainly any clinical signs. Um, and then, you know, if you do document something or you identify an animal at intake, intake for surgery, that may be a higher risk patient, then somebody needs to talk to that owner or agent about that animal's risk specifically. And in a lot of our clinics, we don't actually have time for the veterinarian to stop and actually do that communication. So that can be delegated to one of your staff or one of our technicians can have that conversation. But we just need to make sure that the owner, you know, just like all owners and all practice, that if there's something special about their animal um, that changes the way we're gonna handle them, that we have that conversation and offer them that informed consent. You know, even if there's an additional diagnostic that you would run um, in a not a high volume setting and you would recommend it but you can't do it there but it's still that owner's choice you know even if they're going to decline it we still let, like the owner to make that choice so that's kind of spelled out um, in the guidelines and then we've updated the fasting times to kind of reflect where the field is going that we're not requiring such long fasting times and potentially the longer <laughs> fasting times actually increase the risk of um, problems so for especially for the pediatric animals no more than two to four hours. And I know many of you guys are giving small meals or the um, NutraCal in the morning right before anesthesia for the teeny tinies. And even for the juveniles, you don't need to fast them more than six hours. You shouldn't fast them more than six hours. Um, and even adults, it really doesn't need to be as long as we used to say. 
um, back in the day. And then making sure, especially if you do have older animals, um, that they aren't pulling water. A lot of people, if you tell them to pull food, or we used to say NPO, um, after midnight. To a lot of people that means no water. So especially for their older animals, make sure that they have water available until they come to the clinic. Um, another sort of thing that's highlighted a lot in the guidelines is, is thermoregulation. So making sure that kind of the whole way we handle the animal from the time they come to us to the time they go back to where they came from, that we're trying to keep the temperature up. So that includes the environmental temperature, you know, warming the prep solutions, making sure we're not throwing them in cold steel cages without blankets like I do to my own dog. Um, and then being really cautious with any hot things that you're gonna put near the patient to watch out for burns. In terms of the protocols, you know, there really isn't a lot new there. Um, it's all mostly our old drugs that we're all very um, comfortable using, There's a few changes along the way. Um, and, but it's a good time to kind of go back and review and just remember all the drugs and how they work. Um, most of our spay protocols still include some element of pre-medication, even if that's included in your total injection, um, the anesthetics, and then analgesia. And we'll go over some of the combinations. So one thing I try to explain to my students about is kind of the difference between traditional anesthesia and the way we do anesthesia in high volume. So in a sort of a traditional model, you usually give a pre-medication, usually IM, then you usually wait a while. Um, you put in an IV catheter, you, in, you induce them through a um, IV catheter type injection with injectable drugs, you intubate them and you maintain them on gas. And that's not exactly the way we do things in the spay neuter clinic most places. Um, so most of us will give a single injection that combines our pre-med and our induction into one injection. Um, and oftentimes that's enough. Our surgeons are so fast that that's enough for everything else that we're going to be doing. Um, we may or may not be intubating, and we'll get into that. I talked a lot about that yesterday. Um, we may or may not even be needing to use gas anesthesia, and many times we're not placing IV catheters. So those are some of the differences. The reason we like to give a pre-medication in general is we always want to decrease patient stress and make the handling for them easier and it decreases our stress as well. Um, it also reduces the amount of the other agents that we have to give, particularly the um, inhalant, um, and helps smooth recovery. It's like landing a plane. If you have a rocky takeoff, you're not so excited about landing. Um, it should mirror, takeoff and landing should mirror each other. And this, the, all these principles still apply, even if it's all included into your inject, induction injection. So we always want to include a sedative, something that's going to calm the patient. We always include analgesia, that's required. We may or may not include an anticholinergic, and sometimes we have to um, beef it up a little bit to make sure that they're as sleepy as we need. So the analgesics is generally the opioids, and that includes both the um, agonist antagonist drugs, butorphanol and buprenorphine, as well as the pure agonists. And our sedatives is usually, most clinics are using either acepromazine or alpha 2s, or they have different protocols for different situations. So let's just review the opioids a little bit just to make sure we're all on the same page. So we are giving these prior to surgery because we want to have what we call preventative analgesia. We used to talk about preemptive analgesia, and it turns out that's a term from the research in rodents that it's really hard to prove in, um, in dogs and cats. So we use the word preventative analgesia, the concept that the sooner you get the anal analgesic drugs on board um, before you create the mechanism of pain, it's going to be more effective. Um, this also, the opioids also help provide additional sedation, especially in dogs. Cats can get a little crazy on opioids, um, so they don't always get as sleepy as we would like. All of the opioids decrease our max, so that's what lets us get away with less inhalant. And the inhalant is really the one that causes the cardiovascular depression, the vasodilation, the hypotension that we don't want. So the less, you know, we want the balanced anesthesia, which means a little of this, a little of that. Um, it's why anesthesiologists always want to use like seven drugs, because if you use seven drugs, you get all the good things of each drug and less of the bad things of each drug. So that's kind of that balanced or synergistic concept that we talk about. So butorphanol um, is a mu antagonist um, and a kappa agonist. It does cause pretty good sedation in the dogs, cats, and rabbits that we're working with. Um, it does have a feature of cough suppression. Um, it's considered a mild analgesia. So in most situations of surgery, we don't consider butorphanol to be um, adequate for analgesia. 
The exception to this is when you mix it with your alpha-2 based protocols with or without your telozole based protocols, there has been some research that shows that in that synergistic setting when they're mixed together, you may actually get adequate analgesia from just the butorphanol alone. So you'll find some clinics that are using the um, TD, TD, whatever they call it, TDM versions of the protocols, the telozole, metatomidine, and tor or dexmedetomidine, and butorphanol, where they may not be giving additional opioid, and that's based on the research that shows that that's enough analgesia in that setting. So um, often depends kind of on your setting. Buprenorphine um, is a partial mu agonist. Um, it provides a moderate analgesia. The biggest problem with it for us is that it doesn't provide very much sedation. So it doesn't help us as we're trying to get them sedate and anesthetized. Um, it is a pretty good analgesia, especially in cats. Um, I always tell the students, though, it's very sticky. It likes to stay on the receptors for a long time, so it's hard to reverse it. So it's not something you want to reach for if you have anything critically ill, but that doesn't usually apply in spay neuter. Um, so it's good for mild to moderately painful procedures like a spay um, or a neuter. Um, and it's, it's kind of handy because we can give it um, oral transmucosally. And we'll talk a little bit about buprenorphine as a post-op medication as well. Um, it's not great if you are needing to grab something in a crunch to give additional analgesia if somebody's not reacting like you would expect because it doesn't take effect fast enough. So that brings us to our pure agonists, and many protocols are using these as kind of their foundation. And kind of back in the day, that used to be morphine. Um, morphine was cheap, it was easy to get, um, and it provides very good long-lasting analgesia. Unlike hydromorphone, the metabolites of morphine are analgesic. So you'll get a much longer duration of action with morphine compared to hydromorphone. However, the cost of morphine has recently just gone through the roof. And so many clinics are switching, including my own clinic, switching to hydromorphone um, if that's in your protocol. And it's mostly for cost reasons. Essentially, other than the metabolite issue, they're essentially similar. These are considered your gold standard for surgical pain. But they do have side effects. So vomiting, especially in the non-painful patient, um, respiratory depression, you will see. Bradycardia, we'll see. And then um, in kind of in, with more repeated doses, you start to see ileus, constipation, urinary retention. So it's a good idea with like big dogs who you're giving any pure agonist to, always palpate their bladder at the end of surgery. Um, you know, we usually express all our bladders in prep. So if you haven't done that or if they've filled back up, um, another little thing is if you give alpha 2s, it causes diuresis. So even though you've done a nice job expressing the bladder in prep, your surgeon might be complaining the bladder is filling back up again. That's because of the alpha 2. So let's express them again in recovery, um, especially if they've had a pure agonist because you can see some urinary retention. Or for cats that are going back in traps, a lot of times we don't want to put them back in a trap with a huge bladder because they may not pee for, you know, until they're at released. Um, cats can get kind of crazy, especially, you know, it's a dose-related phenomenon, so we always pair them with sedatives in cats, and we know that they affect the thermoregulatory system. So the, a lot of the hypothermia that we see in our patients post-op is from the opioid telling the hypothalamus, you know, kind of all bets are off, we don't really know what's going on with our body temperature. If you get an opioid, like if you have surgery and they give it to you, we usually feel hot. Um, primates feel hot when they get opioids, and cats seem to get that too. So moving on to the sedatives and tranquilizers, in most of our protocols, that's going to be acepromazine or alpha-2s, and most of us are using dexmedetomidine these days. So ACE is that old-fashioned phenylthiazine tranquilizer. Um, all of these drugs work by depressing the reticular activating system in the brain, so it's anti-dopamine in the brain, and it decreases the release of central nervous system catecholamine. So basically that means sedation. It creates a nice calm patient. It's antiemetic, it has antihistamic effects, um, it has um, good chemical restraint relaxation, it's very reliable in most patients. Um, and there's this controversy now, it's like anesthesia versus behavior. Behaviors say that it's not an anti-anxiolytic, it's not an anxiolytic, and anesthesiologists believe that it is an anxiolytic. So you just have to choose your side. Uh, so some of the negative side effects does lower MAC, um, it does cause hypotension through vasodilation. So we're usually really careful to match the dose that we're using. It's well tolerated in healthy patients, but in older patients or patients that might be sensitive, we're gonna cut the dose back. 
The seizure threshold is a thing we don't really worry about anymore. That's what we were all taught in school, at least us older vets. Um, can't give ACE. I remember working in practice and any patient that had a seizure history, we would write seizures, no ACE in like big capital letters. So it turns out that that was from studies with um, Haldol and other drugs that are used in humans. It was never from any studies done with acepromazine. And they did a study at Tufts that was finally published that showed that you don't change the EEG by giving acepromazine. And if you can't change the EEG with it, that measures brain activity, it shouldn't cause a seizure. So most of us don't think that ACE lowers the seizure threshold. And we will use judicious doses of ACE in seizure patients if otherwise appropriate. It's going to take a while for the textbooks and the journals to turn over on that. Um, but that's kind of, it's kind of becoming that whole like ACE seizure thing is kind of becoming more and more out of favor. It does affect the spleen, so a lot of us will avoid it for any abdominal surgery, including spays. Um, but many of us use it in spays and it doesn't seem to be a problem, especially with an experienced surgeon. And then it will affect your PCV, so all your red cells get marginated. So we're not usually checking that in spay neuter patients, but if you did check a PCV on your patient under anesthesia who had had ACE, you'll see the PCV is quite a bit lower than uh, it was before. And it, because of the vasodilation, it makes them um, feel, cold, feel cold, makes their body temperature drop. So for the alpha-2s, um, they work by stimulating the alpha-2 receptors. They also cause central nervous system depression and a decrease in central nervous system catecholamines. Um, we see really good sedation with these, especially at the higher doses. Unlike acepromazine, the alpha-2 is an analgesic. So that's a really nice feature for spay neuter is that the drug we're giving for sedation also is analgesic. So that's handy. Really good muscle relaxation. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if your patient's really worked up, they're going to clear these drugs faster and they don't take effect as well. And so we often need to use higher doses. And that's where I get nervous about overdose because you give a dose, it doesn't really work. You give another dose, it doesn't really work. So if you ever get that, you know, really fired up, aggressive dog that comes into your clinic, it's always for some reason a Rottweiler, and it just keeps escalating and you try to sedate it and it's not sleepy. We, in our clinic, we often will send those guys home. We're like, you know what, this is not working well today. We're gonna have you come back a different day. We'll sometimes give the owner something to sedate him with at home and we'll try a different you know, version of the dose. But if you start down that road of it, it's not working and you're giving more and it's not working and you're giving more, they're just getting more and more and more worked up. So, I mean, obviously you have to balance the risk benefit of um, not getting them neutered and maybe not seeing them back. But um, I do worry about patient safety in that situation. So it's best to kind of have something that's reliable in those dogs that's, that you're comfortable with is gonna work rather than try a little and try a little, try a little. Um, if you give um, alpha 2s at a high enough dose, you'll see vomiting. We see that a lot in the community cats. Um, but um, we don't tend to see it too much in dogs and cats kind of on the day-to-day -day basis. But it, is, it can happen. And then, of course, we all like the feature that they're reversible. So if we get into trouble with the cardiovascular effects, we can reverse or partially reverse. And it sometimes helps us um, in recovery. So they're very useful in combination with other drugs. So when you give them in this part of the cocktail, they reduce the doses of the other drugs that you need to use. Um, they also reduce your, the max, so the dose of ISO, by half. So that's just something you need to keep in mind to avoid overdosing, but it's also kind of handy so we don't have to use as much isoforin when these are on board. The things that we worry about with them is the profound cardiorespiratory depression, the vasoconstriction, those effects on blood pressure. Um, but the big thing that I worry about is the 50% drop in cardiac output. So I really always make sure that my patient is healthy and I believe that they can tolerate a 50% drop in their out, cardiac output. And that, fortunately, is the case with most of our spay patients. They're healthy and they, these drugs are really well tolerated in our setting. Um, so the anticholinergics is another one of those sort of like hot button topics, and this really seems to depend on where you went to school. Um, so we've kind of changed the wording on this in the guidelines. So in the 2008 version, it sort of sounded like um, if you gave an anticholinergic, you were committing a felony. Um, and now we've sort of softened that a little bit. So it's really at the doctor's discretion. So in your clinics, you may or may not be using it. Um, and then, you know, it's, it depends kind of on the situation and the protocol you're using. The choices that we have are glycopyrrolate or atropine, um, and they work by antagonizing the acetylcholine. 
Um, and we use them to prevent bradycardia um, or in, in, increase the heart rate if we need to. Um, of course, there's always a downside that you can see tachycardia with these, and tachycardia causes increased workload on the heart, and that's why so many people are trying to use these less. So tachycardia, pre-existing tachycardia is an absolute contraindication for an anticholinergic. Um, anybody with heart disease where tachycardia would be bad, and that usually is a cat with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not that we're going to know that in spay neuter, but that's what we worry about. Older patients in general don't seem to um, need this. And if you've given an alpha-2, and I think most people know this, and, and that's caused bradycardia, you do not then give an anticholinergic. Because giving an alpha-2 is like making somebody walk uphill, and then giving your anticholinergic is like making them run uphill. So that's really not great for the heart. So if um, you're worried about the bradycardia, that the patient's not tolerating it, um, you need to reverse or partially reverse the alpha-2. You do not give an anticholinergic. So not all of us are using this in our protocols anymore. Um, and what's, what's happened to us lately is that um, glycopyrrolate has gotten really, really expensive. Um, and so many of us have switched to atropine, even for the pre-med dose, um, just because of cost reasons. But we're more and more seeing people just kind of not giving it, but just giving it if, if needed. You should always have an anticholinergic in your clinic, though, as part of your CPR um, setup. All right. So for induction, whether it be um, an IV induction or a, a combination protocol that you're giving IM, your dissociatives are really going to be your mainstay. So most protocols have ketamine or um, telazole incorporated in them. Um, some people are using propofol IV, and we use that in IV in um, some situations in our clinic. And then alfaxlone is a newer agent. I think only three of the veterinarians were using alfaxalone. I asked them yesterday, is anybody using alfaxalone in their clinic? So I'll tell you a little bit what it is in case you um, run into it. But so far, it has not really, um, it's, it's probably too expensive at this point to really break into spay neuter. So starting with the dis dissociatives, um, that includes ketamine and teletamine. Teletamine is the um, dissociative that's included in telazole. Telazole includes that benzodiazepine right in there with it. Um, these are sympathomimetic, which means they support the sympathetic nervous system. So you'll tend to see, as a rule, less hypotension compared to something like propofol, um, and it tends to maintain your heart rate just from that um, sympathetic um, stimulation that it gives. So that's kind of a cool feature of these drugs that we take advantage of. They're also analgesic, so they work by the NMDA receptors in the central nervous system. So when you have a protocol that includes ketamine, you got to think of that as your analgesic. So that's um, as part one of your analgesic. So that's that's cool. Um, we usually give them with benzodiazepines because they cause so much muscle rigidity and excitement. Um, and the cats and dogs re metabolize these differently. So that um, that affects kind of the way we dose them and what we expect to see. And like I said, many many of our combo protocols have these. So for propofol. Um, we can only give it IV, so this has to have an IV catheter for most cases, or at least, um, you know, most of us aren't super, um, we'll sometimes use a butterfly or something if we have something pop up, but usually we're putting in a catheter, so that's not as practical in a high volume setting. Um, used to be expensive, um, especially because we wouldn't, you know, we might, if we pulled it out for a patient, we often wouldn't use the whole vial. Now they have this um, Propofol 28, which you can keep for a month, so that's, that's better for clinics that just want to have it around for that odd patient, you know, it's maybe a dental or something that you're doing for your shelter, and you want to have the option. Um, the Propofol 28 does have benzyl alcohol, and so when it first came out, we were worried that it would cause methemoglobinemia in cats. Um, I've talked to several clinics that are using it very often in all their cats, and we haven't seen any problems. So unless you're doing something like radiation therapy where you're anesthetizing the same cat every day for 30 days, which of course none of us are doing, you probably don't need to worry about that. But just routine clinical use seems to be quite safe. So alone is a newer sedative hypnotic. Um, it's very similar to propofol. It's been available and used in Australia and Canada and parts of Europe for a long time, like, like 25 years. It used to be available in the United States, but when it, or a similar compound was available in the United States, but when they formulated it, they put it into this like castor oil vehicle, and the pets would have these horrible allergic reactions to it. So it got pulled off the market because of that, and then it's reformulated, and now it's back. So sometimes you'll talk to older veterinarians, and they're like, 
afraid of it, it's because it was that other formulation. It's not this. And it's the same, you know, active drug, but it's now packaged. It's in a different vehicle. So there are some papers on this for spay neuter out of Australia. They used it in six to 12 week old puppies and six to 12 week old kittens. It seems to be have a quite of a favorable protocol uh, profile for side effects and for use in these guys. So it may be something that kind of trickles into our world, but it's not here yet. The cool thing about this drug is that it's, you could basically think of it like propofol, but it's clear, and you can give it IM. So it kind of opens up all these fascinating possibilities if you could give your propofol IM. So instead of having to worry about, so for us, like if we have a fractious cat with a murmur, um, you're kind of like taken out and shot at Tufts if you were to give a cat with a murmur an alpha two. I know there are some places where they weigh the stress of the cat, that's being bad for the heart, versus the alpha two on the heart and they'll give the cat the alpha two, but in Tufts that's like verboten. But now we can give them this alfaxlone, which we usually mix with acepromazine and our favorite opioid, and you have a laterally recumbent cat that can get whatever you need to do, catheter, ultrasound. It's kind of cool. Um, so right now, you know, people like me that work downstairs on the um, ivory towers upstairs, we can run upstairs and bum a dose if we have a cat like that, but I don't see it being used in routine spay neuter unless the cost is going to come down. So, but we'll see. Um, some of your new, you know, if you have new grads coming out of schools, they're going to start maybe mentioning this drug because, you know, we always kind of like the things that we learned about in, in school. That's what we're most comfortable with. Um, for maintenance, most people are using isoflurane, some people are using sevoflurane. For spay neuter, I don't really see much of a difference to switch one the other. The, it doesn't justify the cost of switching out the vaporizers. Of course, I'm an anesthesiologist, so I love having both. There are certain situations I would use one or the other, but in most cases, it really doesn't matter. Um, if you're doing a lot of masking or a lot of exotics, sevoflurane can be handy because you get a much smoother induction, um, but most of us aren't doing that. Um, for analgesia, um, so NSAIDs are really important to add um, to most protocols as long as your patient is NSAID tolerant, so we want um, to make sure that they're healthy. Um, and we have um, local anesthetics, and the new pain management guidelines are saying that a local anesthetic technique should be incorporated into every surgical procedure unless contraindicated. So I think we have some work to do there is using these more. And then obviously the opioids. So for dogs, carprofen and meloxicam are labeled for dogs in the United States. So um, those are what we're using most often for dogs. And cats, we have meloxicam and we have Onsior. Um, if you don't know the health status of the animal, especially an older animal, or if the animal is dehydrated, I would be cautious with these. From what I understand, your chance of seeing toxicity, especially renal toxicity, is much higher if you, um, if you have a dehydrated patient. There's also some controversy. You might hear differences on when you should give the NSAID. Um, so obviously, pre-op would be best from an analgesic mechanism standpoint. The sooner you get that drug on board, the sooner the better. Um, in our clinic, we still give them in the post-op period, and that's because we just don't want to get into a situation where something's happened intra-op that makes us wish we hadn't given the NSAID. So, you know, if the surgeon has unexpected bleeding and you already have the NSAID on board, it doesn't give you the option to hold it. All NSAIDs affect coagulation. Um, if the animal regurges or vomits and you think, yeah, I want to kind of hold off just to be easier on their GI system, you wouldn't have that option anymore. Um, you know, so that's why we give it in recovery. We figure that the rest of our protocol, the ketamine, the alpha-2, the opioid, the local block is all analgesic, and then we're giving that NSAID in recovery, and we're hoping that's going to carry them into the post-op period and help with the infl inflammatory phases of pain. But people will argue with me about that. Um, and then the other thing that sort of keeps me up at night is, like, how long should we be giving them NSAIDs for? Most of our cats, we don't send home with oral NSAIDs. We usually just give them a single injection at the time of surgery. And I feel like that lasts the cats, um, you know, for a day or two after. The cats are notoriously slow metabolizers of NSAIDs. But um, I worry a little bit that maybe we're undertreating them. Most of our dogs in our clinic, we give oral carprofen to if they're healthy. Um, so that's going to vary. And, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you have fabulous surgeons that are super fast with super tiny incisions and super minimal tissue trauma, your level of pain post-op is likely to be very less compared to, like, my, my, our Tuesday, Wednesday dogs at my clinic is 
a third year veterinary student, first time in the abdomen, long incision, long surgery, like those dogs need a lot of analgesics. But I think that maybe your patients don't need so many analgesics. So local box, I said, should be incorporated in every protocol if you can. Um, Lidocaine is very inexpensive. Um, it's technically very simple to do. It provides complete analgesia and it's very little risk. This is a picture of a kitten on the spay wagon that the Animal Rescue of Boston runs. And the way they do it is they have this, the technicians, when they're prepping, they just inject each testicle and then they go and have the neuter. So it doesn't slow them up at all um, and it doesn't really create a problem. Um, things you will hear, potential disadvantages are that you know, it really doesn't last that long. This is only going to last about an hour at the most if you're using lidocaine. You can lose, use bupivacaine and get more, four to six hours, but bupivacaine is more expensive. Um, it does add another step. So, you know, if you've got it down to a science where every move of every one is coordinated and it's valuable seconds, then, you know, you have to weigh the risk benefit of it. And anytime you use a um, local anesthetic, it does have the risk of including, inc increasing bleeding. And, I know some people add epinephrine to try to limit that. It's not something that I typically do or recommend, but it's definitely something that is done. So that's, again, the picture of the technician doing the testicular block. So you can also do incisional blocks, intraperitoneal administration, or these um, sort of splash blocks where you're just applying it to exposed tissue. You always want to be careful that you know what the toxic dose is. So we use usually no more than two mg per kg, and you can dilute that if you need to get more volume. Um, so then the other thing we struggle with is what to send these guys home on, especially if we're thinking they need opioids. Um, we used to do a lot of tramadol, but now it's more difficult now that tramadol is controlled. Um, and also people are really beginning to question the analgesic efficacy of tramadol in dogs. We know for sure the pharmacokinetics are such that you have to dose it maybe up to four times a day, which isn't really something that we can ask our clients or our shelter staff to do. So it becomes less helpful for us. So now I kind of only use this if I have a case where I can't give an NSAID and I feel like I need to do something and or I can't give them buprenorphine. Um, so that's, that's a challenge. Many of us are using buprenorphine for post-op meds in our um, dogs and cats. Um, for cats, you need to use a higher dose, so no lower than 0 0.02 mg per kg, and you should not give regular um, buprenorphine sub-Q in the cat because you won't get um, plasma levels. You won't get analgesia. So the traditional bu buprenorphine that, you know, the kind that we use to use in our um, intra-op or pre-op, um, is, is challenging for us because it's only lasting six to eight hours and we'd really like something to kind of take that patient home for 24 hours um, or not have to re-dose overnight in the shelter. Um, and it's also become really, really expensive. They use this drug a lot for opioid addiction in humans and anytime something that we're using gets popular in humans, it's bad for us because the cost goes up. So some people instead are using the sustained release buprenorphine, um, which you can get from Zoo Farm. Um, there's some concern over the um, site reactions in cats, especially the veterinarians had good discussion about this yesterday. And um, some were saying that as long as you make sure that you really inject this sub-Q and you don't put it into the dermis, that, you, um, that they haven't seen problems and they've had good success with this product. Um, it's a problem in many states because of the compounding regulations. So this may, you know, the, the spay neuter guidelines say that you need to be in compliance with all federal, state, and local guidelines. So it's something that each clinic needs to look at your regulations, and this is a sort of a clinic by clinic decision as far as whether you can use this drug and be in compliance with the law. Um, Simbadol does not seem to be something that people are picking up um, in spay neuter. Um, although in theory, this would be the perfect drug for us for cats. So it's a, you'd give, you give a single injection of it one hour before surgery, and then it lasts for 24 hours. So that, to me, would be ideal. Although some people think that maybe that's too much, because I've seen cats the next day after this dose in there, you know, they're very happy, they eat, but they're like high. So that might be more opioid than we need for these minimally invasive spays. Um, but people in private practice are using this drug quite a bit. Um, it's marketed now by Zoetis, um, it's licensed for use in the cat. Um, again, unclear. There's some features of this that would be real useful for us, but it is expensive. So just to give a couple examples, um, it, you know, there's a bazillion different options out there. 
everybody's going to tweak it a little bit to make it work in their setting. You know, surgeon time is a factor. The time of your whole process is a big factor because it all controls like the duration of anesthesia that you need. And small changes in the dose can kind of affect that. So I never list like my MIG per cake protocols because I find that if you take it and use it in your clinic, it's not going to work like it works for me if my super slow students. Um, so it needs to be adjusted a little bit depending on what your veterinarian wants. Um, for us, for our dogs, we're still using the sort of old-fashioned Tufts um, bag. Now it's atropine, not glyco. So that's butorphanol, acepromazine, and atropine. Um, we just adjust the dose of ACE if we have a sensitive breed or an older animal. Um, we give that IM. They're getting catheters because remember it's a student lab, so we like to have the students put the catheters in so it's not the real world. Um, we would like to use ketamine midazolam because that's a better technique as far as analgesia, supports the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system, you don't get the apnea from propofol, but most of the time we're using propofol is because it's faster. <laughs> it's much easier for us to drop the propofol. Um, we use isoflurane and then they get buprenorphine, they get lidocaine blocks, um, and they get carprofen. Um, and we keep them on buprenorphine the whole time that they're with us. Um, for the very first time our students do their spays, we actually do everything the same except they get hydromorphone for the first dose, not butorphanol. And then the cats were using like a ketamine, dexmedetomidine, buprenorphine cocktail, and they get a single injection, and that's enough for, um, for most uh, spays and neuters. And then we use either meloxicam or onciora depending. For pediatric dog neuters, we're using the dexmedetomidine butorphanol combination, which um, we're really liking. We get good sedation. It's perfect for that procedure. We also use this if we're doing zuterin injections, which we do. Um, and then if they're old enough, we give them carprofen. For our community cats, we're still using TKX. That's um, still the published protocol that's been used on the most number of cats. It has really good um, safety data. They had anesthetic um, mortality of 0.3%, which is on par with any other anesthesia that you would do, which is excellent considering that you have these cats that don't get a hands-on physical exam until they're anesthetized and you don't have any information on them. Um, the reason that we use this cocktail, people asked me this yesterday, um, is because xylazine is less potent. So you don't need as accurate of a dose. So with TKX, you're usually estimating based on the size of the cat and the trap. And xylazine is a little bit more forgiving on that. So even though it's like an old-fashioned drug. Um, we also give them buprenorphine and we give them meloxicam and we give them lots of fluids. There is a protocol that's published out of the same group for um, free roaming cats with dexmedetomidine, ketamine, and buprenorphine, um, and that they had um, good luck with that. They had a lot more um, respiratory depression, but they were using really, really high doses of dexmedetomidine, um, and for me, it's very expensive, so that's why another reason to stick with the xylazine um, for me. A lot of people are using teozol butorphanol with or without dexmedetomidine. These are sort of the Jeffco recipes, which he's published a lot on. These are available in a lot of textbooks. And that's, um, most people are um, real happy with those. And then there's one called the quad protocol for cats, which is used a lot in the um, UK. And that's ketamine, midazolam, dexmedetomidine, and buprenorphine. And I've used that a couple of times. Um, it seems to work real well. And then Humane Alliance is great, so you can get their protocols online most, if you're not a Humane Alliance clinic and you want to look and see. Um, so their website is humanealliance.org. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that's not the right button. <laughs> okay. Uh, should not play with fancy toys. Um, so their website is humanealliance.org, and then you go to e-learning, which is up on the right-hand corner of their website, and then you choose medical. And then for some reason that is unclear to me, drugs is under prep and recovery, and then you choose drugs. And then you go under there and they have all their protocols, which they're updating a lot. Um, I cannot even keep up with it. And um, some videos talking about why they use the drugs that they use. So I think, I probably have this wrong, but dogs are getting hydromorphone or morphine and ACE, ketamine midazolam injection, and they get Medicam. And then cats are given morphine or butorphanol, depending. Um, and then they get teals all index metatomidine, and most of their cats are getting meloxicam. So pretty similar. Most of these protocols are fairly similar. So we had kind of a raging debate yesterday about this whole intubate or not intubate. Um, what the guidelines say is that you must have oxygen and the ability to intubate in your clinic. Um, 
However, especially for cats and for um, short surgery times, you don't have to intubate the cat, especially if you're using an injectable protocol where you're not relying a lot on your isoflurane. Intubation actually might increase the risk of the cat. Intubation itself is not a benign procedure and can cause trauma and can harm the cat um, if it's not done properly. So the way I usually explain this is that if you are a clinic that intubates everybody and everything is fine and you're not having any problems and your techs are proficient or you guys are proficient, you don't need to change anything. If you're a clinic that doesn't intubate because your surgery times are faster than intubation time and everything's going fine, you don't need to feel guilty about that. You're not doing anything wrong by not intubating um, your cats or your dogs. But especially for cats, we actually have evidence that cats who are intubated for short surgical procedures, that's an independent risk factor. Does that make sense? Okay. So the downside if you're masking and you're using isoflurane is increased waste gas exposure, which if you were at the talk this morning, you're now terrified and don't want to go back to work. Um, but, but really, you know, most of us are working in a um, well-ventilated OR and we're using tight-fitting masks. We're using low um, flow, you know, low rates. So um, even if you're masking for short amounts of time, um, you should be monitoring your personnel and making sure, but in general, you shouldn't be increasing your waste gas that much. If you're following all the precautions that she laid out in the talk this morning, um, I, would not, I would not lose sleep over that. Um, you know, if you're in a mobile unit or a really tiny space or you're not being good about your scavenging or you're having tight masks, then you may need to look into that. And if you find you're having to mask like everybody, you may want to <coughs> tweak your injectable protocol to make sure that you get you can get additional time out of your protocol where you won't need to use the mass gas so much. Um, in, in my clinic, I'm usually intubating dogs. Dr. Bushby was talking about how he doesn't intubate dogs. And again, I think that has to do with surgery time um, and comfort level. Certain animals I would always intubate. So brachycephalics, anybody who's overweight, anybody who's pregnant, um, anybody that you're deeming as higher risk, I would always intubate those patients so they have the option of supporting respiration and ventilation in them. In terms of fluids, most of us are not using IV catheters or IV fluids for spay neuter. If you have a, a rare case, you know, a big dog spay that's in heat or a big postpartum, something like that, that may be a patient where you might want to have an IV catheter. Somebody in your clinic, if it's not you, your doctor, somebody needs to be able to put in an IV catheter if needed, even if you're not putting IVs um, ever. But in case of emergency, somebody needs to have the ability to do that. Um, many of us are just giving fluids sub-Q or not giving fluids at all if it's a really short anesthesia and surgery time. So if they're young and healthy and it's quick, it's probably not necessary. If it's longer or they're coming in dehydrated or they have any issues, then I would give fluid support. Um, Pregnant animals in particular, you know, you have a much bigger circulating volume in pregnancy, and those animals need fluids. Even though they're not going to be pregnant for long, by the time we're done with them, their physiology is still that of a pregnant animal, so they need uh, fluids and, um, and, and respiratory support. For the community cats, any cat in traps, we're going to give um, sub-Q fluids because we know that cat's not going to eat for, you know, maybe a day or two after. Um, and we just don't have his ability to intervene if something isn't going well with that cat. So we want to set that cat up for the less complications, the better. And we've given them an NSAID and we knew nothing about them. So I really um, believe that you should give community cats fluids. Um, <clears throat> so in, for post-op, um, we sometimes, you know, worry about should we reverse the alpha-2 or should we not reverse the alpha-2 and you hear different things about that. It's definitely going to depend on your setting and kind of what's going on. Um, one thing that's helpful is this new paper that came out last year in JAVMA. What it showed is that if you are reversing your alpha-2, you're not removing all the analgesia. So the animals that got reversal in that protocol were the same comfort as the animals that didn't get reversed. So we used to say, oh, you know, you're taking away all their analgesia, you don't do that. That's apparently not true. So we kind of, in our clinic, we kind of reverse it, you know, we don't reverse routinely if they're doing well, but if they're showing up to pick them up and they're all in a coma, we're going to reverse. Um, we'll often partial reverse because you can always repeat it. And reversing itself is not benign. When you give reversal, it's kind of like, um, you know, giving them back all those catecholamines that you took away. So you want to be cautious with it. But for many of us, it's very helpful to make sure that they're up and perky and that they can go home when we need to, you know, close up shop. So um, you don't have to worry, at least on the analgesia side. You definitely want to make sure that you're beyond the duration of action of the dissociative. 
you never want to have a cat on just ketamine or just Tylosol. Um, that's ugly. So we had some discussion yesterday about, well, how long is that? Um, you know, certainly an hour. If it's an hour after you gave the ketamine, a, a reversing your alpha-2 should probably be okay. If you do make a mistake, I've, I do this um, from time to time where I thought it was fine to reverse, and oh god, it was not fine to reverse. I usually give ACE apromazine in that setting. And even my cats and traps, you can give ACE um, oral transmucosally, the same dose as the injectable, and that usually calms those freaky cats right down. And those cats, I would expect, are going to be hyperthermic. We're not always temping our crazy community cats that are, um, you know, every once in a while we get one cat that's just like really going out the trap. Those cats need ACE. However, you can get it into them without getting harmed, and they'll calm down, and they'll be vasodilated, and they won't get overheated. All right, so we're going to spend some time talking about kind of the nitty-gritties of monitoring in our high-volume setting, so how we actually keep our patients safe. And the guidelines say that you need to monitor the patient depth, um, the um, function of the cardiovascular system, function of the respiratory system, and patient temperature. So most of us have stethoscopes. Most of us um, are probably not using esophageal stethoscopes. So that's kind of a tool of the teaching hospital, but it's definitely something handy to have, especially if you're doing any field work. They're very inexpensive. You just place them into the esophagus and hook them up to a stethoscope where you've just pulled the end off. And so very inexpensive, it's easy, it's reliable. So if you're traveling anywhere away from your stuff, it's not a bad thing to just sort of have. Um, pulse oximeter is kind of the mainstay. Some of us have EKGs. Most of us aren't measuring blood pressure on all our patients because by the time you get that set up, they're done. So um, I kind of use a 20 minute um, rule of thumb. So if it's something that's gonna take the surgeon longer than 20 minutes, you should think about measuring blood pressure. And then um, some people have caffeinographs. In terms of the standard of care, the ACVA, AA, two A's, we have A for anesthesia and A for analgesia now, um, they have monitoring guidelines posted on their website, and um, so that's a good place to review um, that. Um, and it, most of the aspects we can do um, a good job in a high volume setting. And then it's um, in the R guidelines as well, lots of detail about monitoring. So um, you must, you're supposed to, according to ACV, AA, monitor them every five minutes and record them every 10 minutes. Again, in my clinic, we're not recording at all because um, you're done by the time you would have written the vitals down. But that doesn't mean we're not monitoring them and we're not keeping track of them um, and making sure we know how the patient's doing and looking for any change in their vital signs. This is um, a doctor in Nepal who's monitoring this patient um, under anesthesia for a spay, who's actually like a chicken vet or something. And he knew nothing about dogs or um, spaying or anesthesia. And we taught him how to monitor. And all he had was um, his stethoscope and his um, you know, pencil and his eyeballs. And you know, he was doing a really good job of monitoring this dog without any toys. Um, this is that horrible passive scavenging that she was talking about going out the window. Um, and, and ISO, by the way, is a, is a greenhouse gas. So we, the, we really should be doing everything possible to minimize the amount that's going out into the environment. But anywho, um, the monitoring guidelines now, the ACVA A1, say that you need an objective means. So all of what he's doing is subjective. So that's a little bit out of compliance. So that's where pulse ox comes in really handy because that can be your objective means. And then you've checked all the boxes from the guidelines. So we're doing this because this will help us prevent morbidity and mortality. It allows us to assess trends before we get into a problem, helps us better understand the effects of the anesthetic on our patient, and it helps us um, ensure that they're at the right depth, that they're not waking up, um, and that helps us minimize impairment. The definition of general anesthesia, we want the patient to be unconscious. We don't want them to feel any pain. We need good muscle relaxation, and we don't want them to have any reflexes. So this kind of helps us assess that. In terms of how to do it, you need to have someone whose that responsibility has been de delegated to, whether it be the doctor or the technician. In some settings, it's actually the surgeon because they're in there listening to beeping while they're doing surgery and we're all running around. But whatever it is, it needs to be clear. Everyone on the team knows who's responsible for monitoring. Someone needs to be aware of the patient's status at all times between induction to recovery. 
In my clinic, it's a group responsibility. So I tell them that it's everybody's job to watch them. We're all running around, but we're all watching all the patients that are you know, within our site. Um, you want to be prepared to intervene if there's a problem or alert the veterinarian in charge if there's a problem. And then if you can't continually monitor them, if you're not the ivory tower where we have students that sit there and make dots and crosses, um, someone needs to check that patient every five minutes. Um, and you should use audible monitors so your surgeon can track that. So students are really useful for that. Um, they love to monitor pets. So in our community cat clinics, we'll get like extra bonus students and we'll just throw them on every table and they're just watching those cats. Um, so that's great for us, but you can't always do that if you don't have that um, resource. Although if you ever get students that want to volunteer, you know, that's what they can do. It's hard to keep them from watching the surgery though. Watch the anesthesia. Uh, so monitors are great. So this gives us a, that objective um, tool ongoing automatic audible monitors are sort of the mainstay and a single point in time measurement is meaningful only if extremely abnormal um, generally um, you want to look at trends they can kind of stress us out too from listening to all that beeping so um, you want to make sure you understand how the monitor works and you want know what it means um, so patient depth is really important. We don't want them to wake up. We don't want them to, God forbid, remember what happened. But if they're too deep, we can have lots of problems as well. So we, we don't have good perfusion to our organs if they're too deep. Monitoring depth, we use our eye signs. We use our jaw tone. Um, and so looking at their palpebral, that can be really useful. Looking at um, the pupillary size, we really want their eyes rolled down and their third eyelids up. Now, if we give them ketamine or teletamine, they're going to be dilated. And so it makes it a little bit harder to assess this, but checking this. So this is kind of what we want. That's a light surgical plane of anesthesia is what we want to see. And jaw tone is something that we use a lot. So if they have a lot of jaw tone, we're thinking that they, um, they are um, light. And if they don't have jaw tone, they're deep. But remember that puppies never have jaw tone ever. So you can't use jaw tone in puppies. And many of us are fortunate enough to work with lots of um, pit bull type dogs and they always have jaw tone. They have tremendous muscle mass. So you just have to use all this with a grain of salt. Um, also like uh, responsive to toe pinch, pedal pinch, that can be helpful as well. And then watching your heart rate. So a sudden change in heart rate, respiratory rate, or blood pressure can be meaningful. Usually these will go up if they're light and down if they're deep, but not always. So CRT is something to be careful with. So you can have a normal CRT and be dead. So I use CRT as if it's abnormal, I'm gonna be concerned about my patient and I'm gonna be checking them more um, for other things, checking their pulses, checking everything else. Um, but if it's normal, that doesn't necessarily mean they're fine. And then pulses, so again, just running by and feeling pulses. There's pulses all over the pets. We play games with the students, find the pulses. So using your stethoscope, using your pulses, just so that you have a hands-on feeling of how the pet is doing. I would trust the technician way more than I trust any machine or number. EKGs are nice, but we never rely on them as the sole monitor because they're only, um, they're only giving you the electrical activity. How many people monitor blood pressure in the spay clinic? So a fair bit of you, so that's great. Um, if you do, you wanna to try to keep it above 60 to 70 for a mean, um, and then um, you know, be prepared for how you're gonna intervene if it's, not, um, if it's not where you want it. And how many of you have caffeinography? It's two of you. So caffeinography is really, really useful if you're having an intubated patient. So for those of you that are intubating, it may be something to look into if you're not using it. There's studies in the human literature that show if you use a pulse ox and a capnograph together, you will catch 98% of problems. So it's a very good way to maintain patient safety. It helps you detect problems with your equipment, helps you detect problems with your patient, uh, so it's useful, not always practical, and probably not necessary if your surgeons are super fast. And pulse ox, if you could only have one, I would pick the pulse ox. It tells you a lot about patient perfusion. And I'm out of time. Um, sort of the bottom line is if the patient is not acting like they normally do, if you're having a hard time keeping them asleep, if they have lots of respiratory effort, um, if you're getting a lot of alarming or you can't hear the pulse or it sounds far away, you need to check them out. Or if you are using an entitled CO2 and you have a sudden drop, all those are sort of like my major red flags. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>